right. Good evening, everyone. It's so great to see many of you here tonight, especially on this chilly evening for our special After Hours event. As Mary Lou said, I'm Michelle Ray. I'm the Chief Communications Officer for Pikes Peak Library District and newly involved with Pikes Peak Women. And it's a great honor to be representing both organizations here tonight. And I also want to give a special thanks to the staff of PPLD for all that they're doing for this event, as well as the Pikes Peak Women who made this possible. So as Mary Lou said as well, we're gathered here for the Powerful Women series with our special guest, Loida Garcia Febo. She's the president of the American Library Association. In addition to doing that, she's also an international library consultant, a researcher, a writer, and a speaker. So today, she actually kicked off a cross-country tour of five library systems, and Pikes Peak Library District was her first stop. So she is here with us through tomorrow, and we're thrilled to have her. And then here shortly, Loida will join our chief librarian and CEO, John Spears, on stage, and they will discuss why libraries equal strong communities. Their conversation will encompass the important roles that libraries play in our local communities, as well as examine the impact of diversity, multiculturalism, immigration, and resiliency, some of the themes of All Pikes Peak Read, which is our annual community reading program, as well as touch upon the future of libraries and the impact they'll have on our strong communities. So I'm pleased to welcome Loida and John to the stage. They're two renowned leaders and advocates for libraries. Okay, great. Right on. Mine, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, thank you. No. no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I am on. How's that? Better? Okay, thank you. Tuck my cable. <laughs> hey. Have our cables here. Well, first, I, I just want to thank everyone for coming out uh, tonight. Yes. It is such an incredible honor for the Pikes Peak Library District to be hosting Loida here. Um, I've known Loida for several years, and she is truly, without a doubt, one of the most outstanding presidents that the American Library Association has ever had. And it's a true honor that she chose the Pikes Peak Library District as the first stop on her tour. I'm very excited about that. So, I just want to start off with, um, can you share a little more about the American Library Association and why you chose and decided that you wanted to be the president of the world's oldest and largest library association? Yes, I'm happy to share about ALA. ALA was established in 1876, so we've been around for a while. And um, it's a big family. It, all the members are really uh, people that love libraries. We have, uh, as members, librarians, library workers. We have trustees, library trustees. We have board members. We have friends of the libraries. And we also have, as members, vendors that sell the furniture, the carpet, uh, books, databases. So it's basically everybody that has anything to do with libraries. Many of you could be members. You are friends of libraries. Uh, so it's a big family. And um, one of the things that we do is we support libraries and librarians with the work they do, how they serve their communities. And so um, we have different divisions, and we um, produce um, guides, publish materials, uh, we present some workshops, webinars, in person, online, and it's all to support that, uh, the work that librarians do. For instance, those librarians working with young adults, or at academic libraries or with school libraries, we all support them. And um, well, and then uh, if you ask me why I'm here, <laughs> I have to say that um, when I was looking at the, the map, I wanted to visit all the cardinal points of our country. And so I'm visiting Massachusetts, I am visiting uh, Florida. I am going to be in California, in Seattle, and um, 
I was thinking, well, I want a place in the middle of the country. We need this to really be sure that we're covering the entire country. And um, your library is excellent. And so it's being, it's being on the library news. And so that's a good thing. It's a large system. Plus, um, this is a very special place. Yes. You have many faith-based organizations, you have the military, uh, you have all these things uh, coming together here, So, uh, plus the mountains and the weather, everything is fabulous. So <laughs> I said, yes, I need to go to Pikes Peak, and I'm so glad that this gets to be the first stop. So we're very excited about tomorrow, too. You know, we are, too. I mean, the, it, it's always nice, I think, in Colorado Springs to be put up on the same list as Seattle and Los Angeles and Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> I, I, I don't know that we're, we're too used to seeing Seattle, Los Angeles, Colorado Springs. <laughs> but I, I think for anyone who lives here, and especially anyone that works at the Pikes Peak Library District, I, I think we, we've earned our spot on that list. And so thank yes. you for recognizing that. Yes. I'm so glad. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your Libraries Equal Strong Communities initiative? Um, the advocacy effort that, that is behind that, and then also the Libraries Transform campaign. Why did you decide that that was necessary now? What are you hoping the impact will be? What, what do you want it to accomplish? Yes, yes. Well, uh, Libraries Equal Strong Communities is an advocacy effort. We want to raise the profile of libraries. We want to garner more support for libraries, and we need more library advocates across the nation. Um, Libraries are bringing a lot to the communities. We are providing access to information that help many of our community members to better their lives. And um, this varies, might be a ver uh, something that varies from community to community. Uh, maybe there's a community that uh, might not need help to find jobs, but there are many other communities that do. So across the nation, uh, people benefit from libraries um, for instance, to find jobs, to understand health conditions because they obtain the information at the library. We have many health librarians. And um, for instance, they also understand or start to understand how to navigate the public school system, how to navigate the public health system. And there are many libraries providing different uh, programming for uh, seniors with Alzheimer. They have these quilts where you have zippers and buttons and little windows and all that stimulate your mind, so that's important. And there are libraries that bring doctors and dentists to provide services to the homeless population at the library and then they, got, they have referrals. Uh, there are other libraries like San Francisco Public Library where they have social worker in staff and this person gives referrals to uh, women that's being abused and for shelters and also how to obtain other type of um, help. And so we have this type of uh, different services provided by libraries. And it's important for our elected officials and for the community at large to know what we're doing. We are more than books. We are helping communities to better their lives to also continue with the lifelong learning. And um, we are saving lives. Yes. In many cases, we are saving lives. Um, if someone finds a job, you know, you might have saved their life. And so there are many other things. Maybe you'd like to learn more about genealogy and you come to the library to learn about that or about your, uh, the mountains, your geographical region. I was just in Kentucky and they were talking about Appalachia. And um, I also went to Alaska, and they were talking about other areas there. So there are a myriad of, of things you can uh, learn at the library, you can obtain information. And we want to raise these this, uh, this, uh, possibilities. And so we are going to have the tour, starting here. And we are inviting uh, elected officials. We are inviting community members. Um, we, Whatever we're going, that is a, it's a very uh, multicultural community. We also want ethnic organizations there. It's very important for us. And we want members from the community. We want them to learn what we're doing. And, and for instance, uh, there are other cases where I want to call attention to local issues. For me, it's very important. There are two measures coming up in the ballot here in uh, uh, Colorado Springs, in, the, in this area. 
I think one is 4E, and that will help the Harris uh, County District. The Harrison School District. Yes, yes, yep. yes mm -hmm. Harrison County. Okay. So, and then that will benefit the, the schools, but also the school libraries are included there because they're part of the school. And so this type of, of help, financial help, will help libraries, school libraries, to have more books, to have more technology. And then we have, um, well, if you know someone in the Adams County, uh, we have libraries there, the Anything Libraries, and they are going up for uh, a measure 6A on the ballot. And the, that one will help them to expand facilities, but also to expand hours and collections and yes. services. So it's operational, but also uh, for services. So those are the things that I am promoting. So each one of the cities is going through something and they are facing some issues and they might be on the ballot for certain things. And I want to call attention to that. And I must add that this is a movement. And what I want to do is to encourage other libraries across the country to do this, to have conversations with the community and also um, share with them what they're doing. So hopefully we're going to do that in the five cities I mentioned, but we have a website. Yes. And on the website, we provide information for libraries to replicate what we're doing. This um, rally for libraries and calling attention to what libraries are doing and garnering more support. Um, we also have, and I want to mention this, we have uh, created uh, a profile for uh, a frame for the Facebook profile or Instagram, if that's your thing. And uh, some people have added that and they're calling my attention to the libraries. So yes, this is a very important time in our lives. I think everybody thinks that this is the most important time in their lives, right? Our grandfathers, <laughs> parents thought that, our parents the same thing. So the time we are living is the most important time. And uh, we want to be able to provide services that communities need. But you kind of mentioned that the times that we're living in, and mm -hmm. you know, I, I think um, for a lot of people, um, these times are special. Uh, these times are a little bit different and, and unusual. Um, so when you look at kind of like what the current political and the social environment is, um, you, you've talked a lot about what libraries can do, but you know, let's talk about how important libraries are right now, not just in providing resources, but protecting intellectual freedom. Uh, fostering community engagement and, and, like you said, transforming lives. I, I think there's so much that libraries are doing now that a lot of people 30 years ago never thought that libraries would be called upon to do. Well, you know, and I'm so glad we are there, that we are being a voice for those with no voice. And that's very important. And how, how libraries are the voice of people with no voice? Well. This is what happens. We fight and we defend the right of everyone to access information. And this, in many cases, takes uh, different, different shapes and forms. This is actually based on Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of the United Nations, where it says that everyone has the right to seek, receive, and impart information in any medium, and regardless of frontiers. And so, um, in that case, we have gone to uh, Washington to uh, um, advocate in terms of, for instance, the FCC, the right of communities to access uh, information on the internet, because that will help libraries to provide access to information on the internet. Otherwise, that could uh, affect us, and if it's is it a matter, for instance, that uh, we have to pay more for the internet, then our budget suffers, then maybe we cannot provide that service, and then people cannot access information, they cannot submit um, their job applications, mm -hmm. they're all online, all of them are online. And librarians are helping people how to understand that process. And they cannot do other things, many other things. Uh, perhaps communicate with their family in other countries, because if you don't have a computer at home, and you want to email your mother or something, where are you going to go? Oh, you can go to the library, but if the library doesn't have internet, how are you going to do that? So it's very complex. Mm -hmm. It looks simple, but it's not like that. And so we are here for that. And for instance, um, 
And, and you know, these cases vary from community to community. But if there is some type of situation where certain people cannot access bathrooms, then that affects the access to information we provide because everybody needs to go to the bathroom, right? And so if they cannot, they won't go to the library and perhaps they won't receive the information they need. And then there are many uh, parts or components, I will say, of our communities that uh, for many different reasons sometimes uh, cannot access information if there are certain measures in place. And so that's what I say that libraries are the voice for those, or could be the voice mm -hmm. for those without voice. Because we um, provide information and we advocate for that for everybody. And we have so many people in our communities. And I like your, um, the Pikes Peak uh, Library District uh, initiative. All Pikes Peak read. read. Yes. Because it includes parts of our population that are perhaps some vulnerable groups that um, it, are important for everybody. You have, uh, you have uh, immigrant, you have diversity, and you have um, resilience, and I'm missing one. Um, multiculturalism. 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 Yeah. So, um, and we have all those different groups or, or themes or issues um, everywhere in our country. And so that's so important. And that will help us if we continue supporting libraries and advocating for libraries. Uh, that will, I think, will do very good to communities. You know, you, you brought up those four themes, um, resiliency, multiculturalism, um, diversity, and, and immigration. And how do you see those playing out in libraries in the future? What, what role do you see them having as specific on how can those four things work in libraries to really build strong communities? Yes. Well, I want to say that even though right now, as you mentioned earlier, we might think that we are living challenging times, I think everybody has thought that they were living in challenging times. Our grandparents and our parents as well. But we are, again, living in this time. So for us, this is the challenging time, right? Um, and so libraries um, will be helping communities that um, have those type of populations within their library service area. Um, and we have those communities everywhere. Mm -hmm. We have immigrants all over our nation. Um, we are very diverse. And this is very important. Diversity comes in different ways. We have diversity from people with different linguistic backgrounds. We have uh, genre. We have socioeconomic diversity. We have education diversity. And we can continue at naming. Um, so it's not one piece, it has different components. And libraries are here to help the community, perhaps even understand those components and how to serve them, how we can help them um, better their life. And this term is very interesting because you think better, bettering, you know, better your life is someone that maybe is from a vulnerable community. But it could be for anyone because if you need something and you find it at the library and the library helps you, you're better in your life. So it's a very interesting concept. We are getting very um, uh, theoretical here. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and I think so much of what libraries do, we talked about people going to libraries to receive information. But I think one of the key roles that libraries can play, especially in terms of those four <laughs> concepts, is it's not just a place for people to get, it's a people to give. It's a place for people to give. It's a place for people to share their stories and to share their cultures. You know, yes. you were at the, the Sand Creek Library before you came here. And, and I think you saw a, a, a part of Colorado Springs that a lot of people in the remainder of Colorado Springs don't necessarily know exist and don't realize the culture and the vibrancy of the people that live there. And that is one of the key roles that a library can play too, is helping people tell their stories. And I believe that telling stories is another part of your initiative. Yes, yes, we are going to have a uh as part of the national tour, we're going to be talking to some of the attendees, and they're going to share uh, stories about themselves and also about how libraries are helping them. I wanted to add that the library um, could be a safe place yes. for people mm -hmm. to come together and to attend programs that will help 
and that will um, speak to the different uh, situations they have in their life. Um, libraries in New York, I live in Brooklyn, and libraries in New York are serving as forums mm -hmm. for the community to discuss things. Uh, community boards go there, and it's like a sort of like a safe place, um, and they discuss whether to approve a license for this business or the other, but they come together at the library. They feel they can um, agree or disagree, but the library is going to be okay. Um, they also come to the library to discuss certain matters that affect certain communities. Some groups may be uh, attacking a statue from a certain country. And so it's very interesting. I think it's a very healthy thing that they feel that they can come to the library to these forums and discuss things. I know a library in Louisville, mm -hmm. Kentucky, and it's the Iroquois branch. It has a very interesting name. They host different programs, and one of the programs they host is for women of the world. And um, it's in English, but they welcome people from women from Afghanistan. They have a Hmong community, refugees, Hmong. Um, they have from Vietnam, they have Cuban. And what they do is that they center their efforts in food, cuisine. And so they display, like you have here, uh, books on different cuisine. They perhaps show a film on foods mm -hmm. on different countries. And this program is for women. But, I mean, men can also attend. I can see some men here, too. But um, they come together, and for some reason, they feel very free to share yes. with each other. And they talk about how, you know, the situations they have perhaps on how to get a kid on this school or the other, um, health insurance. They talk about many things. And sometimes they are referred very quietly to places where they can help get help for other areas. So uh, yes, libraries are doing a lot of good to the communities. They are the great equalizer because everybody can feel free and equal at the libraries. We are one of the cornerstones of democracy and we are definitely essential to development. Yeah, you, you see that here, for instance, at our Penrose Library. You haven't had a chance to visit that yet. It's in downtown Colorado Springs. And it has a huge number of people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, but at the same time, it's in the business core of, of Colorado Springs. And you see people coming together there that you don't, they're not going to interact anywhere else, to, to be perfectly honest. And it's one of the beautiful things I think about every library is that no matter where the library is, everyone who comes through the door is just one more member of that community that is there equally along with everyone else. And if someone has to wait in a line, it doesn't matter if you're homeless or you're not homeless. You are in the exact same line waiting for the exact same service. And it sounds like that is so much of what you believe about the role that libraries can play in showing people not only themselves, but showing them the truth about others. Yes, um, you just remind me of something. I just read an article today, um, and it has to do with homelessness and service, uh, services to them. Um, it's from the Newark Public Library in New Jersey. And they have partnered with the city, uh, the local government, Newark, uh, I guess, mayor or city. And um, they are saying that if there is a place where the homeless population feel that's okay to go to get a haircut, a warm meal, hot meal, and some clothes is the library. Mm -hmm. So they are hosting a day where they can go, all the homeless in the area, all ages, to get groomed, look good, um, get some clothes, and change of clothes, and have a hot meal. And that is a beautiful thing we can do for our communities. At the same time, they're going to have book displays and library cards, which are free for everybody. And, and that's another part, that homeless people can have library, mm -hmm. library cards as well. We just have to work out the right policies to, for them to be able to check out books and materials. Yeah, we allow people to use the addresses of some of the shelters in town here exactly. for, for their yes. home. And, um, yes. I, I, this is going to be a shameless plug on myself. That program in Newark is actually based on Project Uplift that started in Salt Lake City. Oh. Anyway. Um, Fantastic. <laughs> <Yep>. You see? <laughs> yeah. um, it's a very small uh, library world, and I'm glad that they are replicating that. 
It, that's one thing I love about libraries is we steal shamelessly from each other, but it's, <laughs> but it, it, it's, it's for such a good thing yes. because no matter how unique our communities are, we all have the exact same goal in mind, which yes. is to build our community and to give people the tools that they need to create the lives that they want. Yes, yeah. and that's why libraries equal strong yeah. communities. Yeah. So um, to, to close out uh, the conversation, then we're gonna go into a, a, a Q&A uh, for anyone who might have a, a question for Lloyda. Um, how do you see community members, such as everyone in, in this audience that's here tonight, what role do you think they can have in helping to raise awareness about the positive impact that libraries can have on communities? How can they help reinforce what it is that we do? Well, I have to say, you are very important. You are key for, uh, to, give, to uh, bring our message to others. Not only elected officials, yes, that's wonderful because they are the ones that can help us a great deal, but also to our family, to our friends, because they will become, I hope, library supporters. So you are very important. Um, in, in, in coming to these programs and talking to the librarians and coming to the library events, it's very helpful because then you learn all the wonderful things the libraries are doing. Like I said before, we're more than books. We are bringing out um, access to information in so many ways. Access to information could be uh, through books, through movies, through songs. Um, it could be on databases. It could be uh, on a webinar online. And of course, I mentioned the books, the magazines, and all the printed materials. So um, the medium can vary the way we do it. But we are providing access to information. And not only that, libraries provide access to information, but they won't just do anything with it, right? We help people to understand how to utilize it for their benefit, for better their lives. And so another way that you can help is, uh, of course, uh, talking to your elected officials, um, and there are many cases where libraries will uh, need you to pick up the phone and contact their offices or uh, mail a letter or email. You can, uh, in some cases now, we can text or you can tweet. It's, you know, it's different ways now. We have different uh, ways of doing that and, and we can do that. Um, and so that's important that we are open to, to support the library in those ways from our home. Just pick up the phone, text, email, tweet, and that's very good. And so I encourage you to uh, please continue supporting the library in those ways. Um, and you have friends and you have families and you can share that with them. Um, I have a very interesting uh, example. We work, we have a, a, an office in Washington, D.C. And uh, we work with the Harry Potter Alliance. And they are a fan group, fan group. And so what they do is that they love Harry Potter movies and books. But they also have an amazing fan base, thousands and thousands of people. And those, those members of the Harry Potter Alliance have families, and they have friends, and they have become hundreds of thousands of library supporters. So when we need them to contact our elected officials, for instance, um, they are there for us. And so they uh, contact, the, in this case, are at the federal level, Senate and legislation. Um, and so that's what we need. And uh, I would want to thank you for uh, supporting the library. If you are here, it's because you are interested in libraries. So I want to thank you for that. And I hope that you continue being uh, good library supporters. Well, at, at this point, I, I think that um, we'd really welcome any questions that, that you might have for Lloyd about the American Library Association, about advocacy, about the role that libraries can play in communities. Yes. Well, I think everybody in, in, in this room knows the importance of libraries, but it seems like the criticism comes from a different segment, and I would call it the business segment of the community. So is there a something, an argument, or a position that we could express on how libraries are also supportive of businesses. Because the things I hear is, oh, you just have the homeless people 
Penrose or, you know, who needs this? Um, which I think is an amazing position when there's so many articles about the books that Obama read or the books that uh, Bill Gates reads and how they talk about it's an essential part of their makeup to read multiple books uh, throughout their, their business life. So I need a good answer to why libraries are important to businesses. Oh, wow, okay. Well, let me tell you stories. Stories are the best um, argument we can use. And we can um, talk to the librarians if we don't have good local stories, but we could, um, I have a good story for you right now. Um, and this is uh, not a, a promotion for this business, but uh, you might know about Overdrive, and they provide this wonderful app, Libby. You can download the book, and it's fabulous from the comfort of your home in your pajamas, you just download the book, and you went to the library. Uh, and so the, the, the person who started that company, and still the CEO, he, uh, when he was um, looking for business models and how to structure the idea, he went to the public library. And the business librarian helped him there. And he got his papers together, and um, slowly but surely, he built his business. That was 33 years ago, and he is he is very successful, yes. <laughs> not only in this country, but around the world, uh, in every continent. And so that's a good story, because there is someone that is a very successful businessman and started at the library. So we need to be open and um, provide, keep the library open, welcome everybody, homeless, uh, LGBTQI teens, or all different ages persons from different countries, and there might be a line after, outside the library because they're waiting perhaps to get into the library when it's nine in the morning or something. Or maybe they, they might just stand outside the library after they use the library. Um, and so, but there is always the opportunity there to impact lives. And those people could become businessmen too, or businesswomen and can become part of the association of local business. So there is something there, and I hope this, uh, you know, that could be a good story. But there are others. Um, and is the oldest story in the book that we are saving those, helping to save those lives. We are really making an impact to try to better their lives. And if we don't want to have perhaps homeless people in our communities, we could help them to access information they need to find that first job, part-time, hourly, you name it, uh, that might help them to get out of whatever situation they're in at the moment. At the moment, yes. So I hope that helps. We can write a book about that. We can have classes about that entire semester. Um, and I know it's a complex issue. Um, but I think the stories will help us, and I think the local librarians have good stories. Yes. And I hope this one I, I told you about, that share with you about Overdrive was good. Yeah, I, 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 if it's okay to add yes, that, sure. from, from a local perspective, since she's here, I'm going to call her out, um, is Terry Zarsky, our business librarian, um, who is absolutely phenomenal. Business is just, everything that's said about individuals, can also apply to the health of businesses as well. Businesses rely on information. Businesses need demographic information. Businesses need marketing research. And where so many businesses will go out and pay a small fortune to get that information, what they need to realize is they've already paid for it, and it's available at the local library. We can give marketing lists, demographic information, population projections, psychographic data, that is literally the exact same information that businesses pay thousands of dollars for. And that's available here. One other thing is that businesses rely on a workforce. That workforce has to be educated. And it's an unfortunate truth that very often when it comes to STEM, to science, technology, and well, I, first, I hate saying STEM, STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, that libraries are the places for children, for teens, to get the education that sometimes is a little bit lacking in their schools. 
Not only that, because of the way testing is done in schools, libraries are the last bastion very often for these youth to be able to explore their curiosity. And self-education is the best education. And when you allow and provide a community resource like a library, it's a long-term investment, but that's when you're gonna get a workforce that is absolutely amazing and that knows the technology, that knows the community, and that knows, most importantly, how to think critically. Because no offense if there's any teachers here, you don't have time to teach that in school. We do in libraries. That is what our degrees is in. Our, yeah, that's, that's what our degrees is in, yeah. You are doing yeah. so well. <laughs> Cut that last part. <laughs> but that, that's what we're here for. And you know, it, it, sometimes you have to make an economic argument. And that is an economic argument. We're educating children, we're providing information. And when you look at what the return on investment in libraries is, there are studies. It is $5.35. Every dollar yes. that is invested in a local library returns $5.35 to the community. Our budget here at the Pikes Peak Library District is $32 million. The return on investment that we give to the economy of the Pikes Peak region is $150 million. Yes. I want to add something. I was just in Georgia, and in a kind of like rural area, Columbus, Georgia, and libraries there are working with farmers. Mm -hmm. And so they are providing help for uh, water systems, yep. mm -hmm. how to plant the different type of uh, uh, seeds, and uh, when is best, and then the water system. And they also can use their website. Some of them don't have uh, computers at home, and so, but they do have a website. Someone helped them to create a website. So they go to the library to check how things are going. And um, that's another type of, of business. But I wanted to bring that up because perhaps you have some friends okay. that are uh, no uh, farmers as well. We've got a thousand square miles of farmland <laughs> in, our, in our district. <laughs> All right, yeah. so this is yeah. fine. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I, I was just wondering uh, what kinds of issues and challenges keep you up at night uh, when it <laughs> comes to libraries? And well, I, this was keeping up. <laughs> keeping me up at night for many years, this type of uh, how I could um, structure something, coordinate something to garner more support for libraries nationwide. And I'm so glad that uh, people like John and the other libraries are helping, and hopefully we can uh, have a, increase our library advocates network. But the other part that I'm, I'm very into communities. I like to um, help communities, serve them. So the other part that keeps me up at night sometimes is the, this measures, for instance, the FCC. Uh, there are all the measures that have to do with copyright, and they're just recently at the federal level. Uh, there is another one that was about the Marrakesh Treaty, and this is to help the print disabled individuals. And finally, the Senate passed it last week after 10 years <laughs> advocating for that. Um, and this will help us to become part of the international community that is working already with um, um, international bodies in Geneva to be able to share resources to help the print disabled. If we are not part, if, we, if our government didn't have approved to be part of the Marrakesh Treaty, even though those resource, resources are there, we cannot be part of them. And now we can since last week, after 10 years of fighting for that. And then we have others uh, that might impact libraries locally, um, and, and the, the, the measures I mentioned and the ballot are some of them, but then we have these things that perhaps um, can't uh, stop the access we bring to certain parts of the population where we have to justify having um, materials in other languages in our libraries, or uh, displays, like the beautiful display you have there, uh, featuring the Pride Month, perhaps, or Halloween, or Christmas. I mean, it goes in all directions. Yes. And so that type of situation kept me up at night, and that's why I want to bring it uh, to your attention and to you know, um, the audience's attention wherever I go. Uh, Colorado Springs, we have a history of not wanting to pay our fair share. We don't want to pay taxes. 
I think uh, Councilman Murray knows that the five-year plan to do the roads has been a great tax that we did. I know my neighbor and you kind of squabbled back and forth uh, on his uh, letter to the editor. Listening to oh. your uh, explanation now, I, I would like to see some uh, possible published explanations, whether it be in the paper, on your website, the county website, to let those that aren't here learn a little bit more of, you know, what you're doing with that $32 million uh, budget. You know, everybody, oh my gosh, $32 million, that's a big budget. But I would like to see, you know, uh, a more educational breakdown so that the community would understand if whenever the county commissioners would have the, uh, I'm not gonna say, uh, the courage to try to raise uh, property taxes that we might be able to do something. So, do you mind if I just- That's quick, yours. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> um, first, thank you. Um, second, thank you. And third, thank you. Um, we, uh, the Pikes Peak Library District, 32 million uh, does sound like a very large amount of money. Um, it is $32 million that serves 642,000 people from 14 locations with 500 staff. And the things that we do with that, I believe are pretty exceptional. Um, that amount is actually on a per capita basis, $39. Uh, the amount that we get from taxes. We do have some other things that we do to generate revenue a, as well, although one of them is not selling our services. We will never, ever do that as long as I am here. Um, and the, uh, our, our per capita, the amount we get, $39, um, that is about third from the bottom of the large libraries in Colorado. Uh, Denver gets 60. Um, Arapaho gets over a hundred. Um, Weld County, um, I believe, is around 120. Um, this is something that will resonate with residents of Colorado Springs. Pueblo is 50. Okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, we are one of the um, one of the lowest funded libraries in the state. Uh, the last time that this library had a tax increase was 1986. And we have tried three times since then, the most recent time being 2002. Now, it's interesting that you bring up the county commissioners because this is um, a little bit of a point of uh, contention sometimes. We are an autonomous district. We are a special district by law, constitutional law, in the um, state of Colorado. We do not report to city council or to the board of county commissioners. Sorry, Bill, but you know this. Um, <laughs> um, now, what, what we do, we do have oversight in one way from uh, city council and the board of county commissioners. They appoint our board. But once those board members are appointed, they no longer answer to, they are, are meant to be representatives of the community. And they answer to the community. But we set our own levy. And we set our own budget. But we are limited by Tabor. Um, we are one of only three library districts mm. in the state that has not de-tabored. De Let me make sure I use the appropriate term. Um, and uh, that has a big impact on us. Every year we leave several million dollars on the table mm. that we could have collected if we were not subject to the Tabor limitations. Um, there will come a time soon where we need to go for a tax increase. Um, there's no question about that. We built this building. We built High Prairie. We added an hour of service. We added a bookmobile. We've renovated several of our locations. We expanded Monument. We expanded Rock Rimmon. We expanded Holly. All of that was done without an increase in taxes. That's not sustainable. And that's one of the reasons why I think Lloyda's efforts, what she's doing is so incredibly important because this isn't something that the library can do alone. We need 
advocates. We need you. And I am incredibly grateful for LOIDA for bringing the weight of the American Library Association behind this initiative because it's giving us the tools and it's allowing us to work together with other libraries so that we can hopefully get the revenue that we need to keep providing the services, let alone keep expanding them. So thank you. Well, we have a 58,000 member team yes. that include institutions, library associations, individuals, and all the type of members I mentioned earlier. And I did realize I totally ignored your actual question. Yes, we do need to educate people. <laughs> we, 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 we need to do that much better because I don't think people know what we do. Lloyd is helping give us those tools so that we can well, tell say, those stories. If, if we haven't had a, a tax increase or levy increase since 86, mm -hmm. I think that we could start slowly educating more than the 40 or 50 yes. people that are sitting here by doing a little bit more outreach. Well, and we saw, you know, for instance, the editorial that uh, appeared in the March 29th Gazette. Um, <laughs> you remember. Did, um, you know, we, there was uh, one of the things that was so wonderful for us as a library district, um, it was the day you interviewed. Oh, I know. We are, <laughs> if you want to know something fun, interview, your, uh, interview a potential chief communications officer the day you really need a chief communications <laughs> officer. Um, but the, the response that we wrote that appeared, um, that, that was a Thursday. The response appeared on, I believe, Monday. Um, the response from the community um, was phenomenal. Um, it was incredibly heartwarming for the library to see that, wow, we have people that, that, that are defending us. Because sometimes it can get a little, you know, you tend to hear from people when they're not happy. Um, but the, le the letters to the editor, because originally what the Gazette has said is, we'll collect both sides and present a balanced approach. They gave up on that because no one was writing agreeing with it. Um, you know, when you write saying defund the library, hopefully that's not popular. Um, so that process, we, we've got a leg up, but you're right. We really need to do a lot more education in terms of how we operate, where that money goes, and the benefit that that money returns to the, uh, to, returns to the taxpayers. Yes. I can't yep. resist. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, Use my name in vain, so to speak. So well, actually, what's, what we're seeing is we're actually turning the corner. Yep. 2A and 2C, a clear indication that as you present your case of need, that the community stands up and says, yeah, okay, we'll do it. I don't like all the cones and not being able to get here. But uh, having said that, we're actually seeing quite a bit of, uh, of actual effort. The two examples we just uh, heard, one was uh, when Tim Lee, I used his name, said, hey, how come yeah. they're getting as much money for the library system as we're getting for the government? It's because the government screwed up. Period. There's no question about it. The government here stands up and says, we can do everything with sales tax. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so what's happened today, if you look at the issues now on the ballot, okay, we're actually fighting with the rest of the state, okay, for road taxes and everything else that the other communities need. So when we go and ask for something, they say, the heck with you, because you didn't support us. What goes around comes around, it's now getting worse, but you're seeing a very distinct shift. The story time issue that uh, uh, some of you may be aware of, I got 400 emails. But you'd be surprised. I responded to all 400 of them. And the ones that were real, because a lot of them were fake, mm -hmm. it was, uh, you know, they were sent out to us with other people's names on it. Okay, the vast majority responded back, thanked me for the information, yeah. and thanked me for the library system. There are a lot of things we can do, and, but what happens a lot of times is we let somebody else capture the narrative. Okay, what's the first narrative that I talk about? And that is, what's the difference between Google and the library? Well, the library's impartial. Google's an ad agency. They want to sell you stuff. What's your point? The whole first page is to sell you stuff. It's not real. Okay, and that's what you've got to remember. And when you're talking to folks, you say, this is the impartiality. And if you go to the library, you'll get impartiality. Not somebody telling you, to look at the Fox News, or so, sorry about Fox, or some of these other InfoWars. Has anybody ever seen InfoWars? <laughs> Holy smokes, happy campers. 
<laughs> Man, I'm so glad they, they took them off the web. It was all web-based. But having said that, and, and, but I will take one exception. We may, may not be involved specifically in the running of the Pikes Peak Library District, but I was the one who got the 400 emails mm -hmm. <laughs> complaining, telling me to take action. And I said, I will. I'll support them. Yes. And that's what it takes. You got to stand up and you got to stand your ground. You got to support the system. And you got to explain how important it is, even though you're not directly connected. We're all going the same direction, ladies and gentlemen. We just need to settle in and, and agree to that the process. I said too much. No, no, if, if it's okay, um, I, I want to thank Councilman Murray. Um, there, there were several elected officials that stood by the library during our most recent intellectual freedom battle. Um, uh, Councilman, uh, uh, Councilman Gabler, um, uh, Councilman Murray, um, several others a little bit more quietly behind the scenes, but, but they did. And uh, there's one other group that, that's, uh, if, if you want to know what we're talking about, <laughs> if you don't know, um, ask me afterwards. Because uh, <laughs> it, it would take the, the rest of the time. There was one other group, too, and I think that this might be something that, that, that Lloyd can expound on. One other group that we had a tremendous amount of help from was the Office of Intellectual Freedom at the American Library yes. Association. And I know um, one way that we met was actually through Yes. A larger association, the International Federation of Library Associations, there's a, a group in that called the Freedom of Access to Information and Freedom of Expression. And I think that this is something that you feel very passionate about, is the importance of intellectual freedom in libraries. I didn't know if you'd like to comment on that. I've been working with um, essentially human rights, yeah. which is part of the intellectual freedom for a long time, since I was a baby librarian, yeah. 2003. And, um, it's so important for our societies to keep our democracy, to continue development. It's one of the cornerstones. And it's one of our core principles of librarianship, intellectual freedom. Yes. And that's within the human rights um, umbrella, I will say. And I'm glad that we, had, uh, that this, we have an office for intellectual freedom um, at the ALA level. And we also have one at the International Federation of Libraries. And that one is a federation based uh, with headquarters in The Hague. And all the library associations from the world, different countries, are members. So it's at that level. And I have, I have advocated for libraries at the United Nations representing them mm -hmm. in terms of the access to information that everybody on this planet, the right that everybody on this planet has to that based on the Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from the United Nations. Um, it's a long, it's a, it's a very complex topic, but the bottom line is that, that everybody has the right to receive and impart information, seek, receive, and impart information. Mm -hmm. And that includes uh, the different story times yes. that you may have at the library yeah. and, and all the different, um, situations that may prevent us from providing information to different parts of our population. I, I want to commend Ashley Lloyda for her work in that effort. I, a lot of Americans are not familiar with something called the uh, UN Agenda 2030 and the sustainable development goals that are in there. Uh, there's one of those sustainable development goals, number 16, that the work that Lloyda specifically and her team did at the United Nations made access to information, not just something that appeared in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights 70 years ago, um, but an actual part of how international organizations define a sustainable society. Um, yes. I was, that was her. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Real fast, can I ask uh, Lloyd a fast question? Uh, our low income and minority students are scoring very low on reading scores in, in many of our school districts. Do you have any answers on how our schools or library systems could uh, help uh, enhance those and the message out to our low uh, income parents and uh, minority parents and students, how the library system could help? maybe uh, assist the schools and parents and that whole uh, 
uh, population to increase that, those reading skills? I have an example for you from um, Amherst in Massachusetts. The Amherst uh, University uh, uh, Library, the librarians there partner with the local schools and they go as far as Springfield in Massachusetts, which is maybe a half an hour or so, and they bring uh, reading lists and they have partnered in a way where the school library can obtain um, books, the children can uh, borrow books and their parents from the local libraries through this type of uh, intervention from the university library. And they are doing well. Um, I think uh, it has helped the, this um, uh, elementary school. And, and that's very good because you are tackling that need at a very early age. Um, and I will say that's a good model to look into. Mm -hmm. Perhaps is that's a situation here in the state, um, how your academic library, public library can partner with the school libraries. And, and, and I will say if you can at elementary school level, it's good because the kids are still learning and growing, um, but they can be helpful for middle school and high schools. Definitely, like if librarians can do something, is put together reading, reading lists. And, and materials to help others read, from the basic and simple to the more complex. And, and please reach out to me. We have several very specific programs that address that. Um, we have specific tutoring programs. Um, a, a lot of what we do with the ESL uh, students uh, could fall under uh, into that. And then some of the ways that at three of our branches, we do very specific programming for at, uh, for at-risk youth. Um, I'd be more than happy to tell you about some of the things that we do there, too. Both Florida and John will be available for the next half hour for all of your questions that, um, that you didn't get a chance to answer or you're maybe a little shy to ask in front of such a big group. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lloyda, for coming here. Thank you, John, for spearheading this effort, no pun intended, um, to, uh, <laughs> to involve Pikes Peak women and the Pikes Peak Library District in such a wonderful um, collaboration. And I'm also here to give you a, yes, a round of applause, please. <laughs>